great to see you. We're shooting a documentary about car culture in the UK and I need a second driver. You've made a name for yourself and it would be great to have you aboard. It's simple. You drive, I tell the story. Let's do it. Uh, I know you want more time in that car, but we really do need to get this shot today. From Aston Martin to McLaren and Bentley, Great Britain is home to over a century of automotive excellence. I'm Rebecca Dawson. Welcome to British Racing Green, a documentary celebrating that history. The Aston Martin DB5 Vantage was the quintessential grand tourer of the 1960s combining British engineering and Italian design. featured side draft carburettors and a refined camshaft profile capable of a blistering top speed of 162 miles an hour in 1964. The clean lines of Superleggera's bodywork, reclining seats and wool carpets created a car that was luxurious as well as fast. This car would form the basis for the DB range, with later cars improving on the design in many ways, but none would ever achieve the sheer iconic perfection of the Vantage. For all of its beauty and engineering perfection, only 65 of these beautiful machines would ever be built. If you own one, you own a piece of British history. Silver DB5 would be immortalized in half a century of cinema. The classic Aston Martin. But in 2016, a new DB was unveiled, heralding the dawn of Aston Martin's second century. The DB11 is the first production turbocharged Aston Martin. But is it a worthy successor to that legacy? The short answer is yes. It's bold, responsive and agile. It's perhaps the best GT chassis in the world. And listen to it. Able to hit 60 miles an hour in 3.5 seconds, the DB11's 5.2-litre twin-turbo V12 boasts a top speed of over 200 miles an hour. DB11 is not the fastest car in the world, but then it's not trying to be. It's sophisticated, effortless luxury. It's an Aston Martin.
The DB11's front strakes channel air to create a virtual spoiler, providing downforce without compromising the car's clean lines. Brilliant. Most importantly, I think, the DB11 proves that Aston Martin is ready for another century of beautiful cars. And I can't wait. Beautiful as they are, Aston Martins are only one of many cars made in the United Kingdom. Let's see what else is out there. This is shaping up nicely. Time for a change of pace, though, at least at first. The next segment is about Land Rover, and we'll be starting out with the Type 3. Land Rover, the British sports utility vehicle. But before that, they were actual utility vehicles. Solid, tough trucks, unstoppable over almost any terrain. The Land Rover Type 3 marks the point where that shift begins. And we'll be looking at what that meant. Over half a million Series 3s were built, and over 70% of those are still on the road today. They were extensively exported and built under license abroad. Belgium, South Africa, even Australia and New Zealand. With a robust chassis and signature Land Rover engineering, the Type 3 also marked the first time that buyers could choose interior options, like seat box protectors and cubby boxes. That trend continued, and by 1982, Land Rover were offering the County Spec Type 3. Leisure drivers could choose from such luxuries as all cloth seats, soundproofing, and tinted glass. The trend was increasingly clear, and the future of the Land Rover was starting to take shape. If you squinted, you could already see the shape of the first sports utility vehicle, the Range Rover. While the stock Type 3 would never be particularly fast uphill, there is almost no hill that it couldn't climb, or dam for that matter, if you put a proper winch on it. In 1978, a Series 3 was custom-built for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It only had 1,892 miles on the clock when it was auctioned into private hands. And it was in perfect condition. It would be. After all, she trained as a mechanic in the 1940s and will likely remain the only royal able to strip and rebuild an engine. Along with the Range Rover, others would follow. Discovery, Defender, and the Freelander. Each a more sophisticated and enjoyable utility vehicle. But none of them were a replacement for the Type 3. They were a different kind of car. The Type 3 was arguably the first sports utility vehicle, an evolution of the design that would lead ultimately to this. The Bowler Nemesis an off-road racing vehicle that turned into a production SUV, 
the Nemesis EXR. It sports a turbocharged 5-litre Land Rover Jaguar engine crammed into a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grille, headlights and rear lights from a Range Rover. And there are no compromises either. With a 0 to 60 time of an unreal 4.2 seconds, all wheel drive and the ability to corner near instantly, the Nemesis provides adrenaline and sheer terror in equal measure. This is an all terrain supercar. That's the only fair description for this. But that's what you get when you build an SUV. Hope you're enjoying yourself. I know I am. It's great to be able to just focus on telling the story while someone else handles the driving for once. Let's get to the next one. This time, it's Lotus. Lotus Engineering Limited began as many stories in British engineering do in an old barn. The first Lotus cars were offered as kits. You built them yourself. From 1962, they began to actually build the cars themselves. The Elan Sprint showed exactly what they intended to do. Designer Colin Chapman famously said, adding power makes you faster on the straights. Subtracting weight makes you faster everywhere. He knew what he was talking about. Widely hailed as one of the greatest sports cars of the 1960s, the Elan would be closely studied and emulated, inspiring such masterpieces as the Mazda MX-5. The Elan has all the energy, style and enthusiasm you would expect. Bold, quick and fun. So much so that they put it in the name. The Elan Sprint was a financial as well as an engineering success for Lotus, validating their approach to design and resulting in a whole family of light, agile roadsters. Which brings us to this, the Lotus Exige. It's heavier than the Elan, admittedly, but it's faster, much, much faster. Touch the pedal, the Exige responds with instant, relentless acceleration, as you'd expect. 
with a 0-60 time of 3.8 seconds and a top speed of 170 before upgrades and tuning, the Exige is uncompromising. And there's no power steering, so you can really feel the road. A genuinely thrilling drive, and one that isn't afraid to demand you take it seriously. In one word, Lotus is about the experience. Uncompromising, challenging. This is a car that demands you drive it well. And when you do, you'll see what the fuss is all about. And with rumoured launches of two new cars in 2020, Lotus looks set to push the benchmark of the experienced sports car well into the next century. Done much rallying? That's a joke. We've all seen what you've been up to. We're doing the next bit on location. You'll see why when you get there. Ford, that most American of cars. But the Ford Escort, oh, that's British. And more than that, the Escort would become for many synonymous with Group B. In the 70s, Ford had embraced that destiny so firmly that they'd begun their own championships to find new drivers. Drivers for cars like the RS 1800. This was a car designed explicitly for rallying, with a powerful fuel-injected 1790cc Cosworth BDE engine. Homologation rules required that all cars entered into the group be production. So Ford built 200 of them. The RS 
Paris 1800 raced to victory after victory across the rallying world on almost every continent and across every terrain type imaginable. This car was basically unbeatable. The RS 1800 brought home 17 World Rally Championship victories for Ford. So, of course, Ford set out to design a better one. The RS 200 Evolution was their answer. A purpose-built rally car designed to do one thing, win Group B. With a 1.8 turbocharged Ford Cosworth BDT engine and all-wheel drive, the RS200 had perhaps the best suspension platform of any car of its era. The chassis was fiberglass from Reliant, and the massive Ford parts bin was raided to give the car that iconic look. But while the car had potential, turbo lag at low RPM and a poor power-to-weight ratio meant that it never placed better than third. The end of Group B in the mid-80s meant the end of the RS200 as a rallying car. Fortunately, Ford built over 200 as part of the homologation requirements for Group B. So you can still find them, if you're lucky. You know, I really like this car. Not that I'd want to drive it for too long. Squeeze yourself in there and let's see just how fast you can make it go. Which won't be too fast. But hey, I could be surprised. The Peel P50 has the dubious honour of being the smallest production car in the world. A one-door microcar coupe featuring a 42cc air-cooled engine capable of a heinous 38 miles an hour and a handle so you can pick it up and carry it with you when you get to work. And keep in mind that this is the production version. The prototype had the single wheel at the front. Why would you think that was a good idea? In 2010, though, production restarted at Sutton in Ashfield. So, if you'd like to own the modern incarnation of this, I suppose you can. Hey there! How about a car with some actual legroom and some actual speed? This section's about what happened when McLaren decided to make a road car. You're going to enjoy this. The track and the road have very different requirements. For McLaren, that was a challenge they were more than willing to embrace. In 1988, they set out to create the finest sports car the world has ever seen. By 1993, they had achieved their goal, and the honestly fantastic F1 was the result. 106 would be built across all variants, and it remains one of the very best road cars ever made. The F1 has no turbocharger. That would have compromised the driving experience, increased complexity, and resulted in turbo lag. The F1 is a naturally aspirated supercar, one of the fastest in the world, in fact. The F1's monocoque chassis is incredibly lightweight, only 100 kilos all told, which posed a significant challenge because carbon fibre and fibreglass aren't great insulators. So, McLaren lined the entire engine compartment with gold. In 
In 1998, the F1 prototype set the world record for fastest production car, a record that would stand for two decades until the Koenigsegg CCR claimed the crown. McLaren's racing heritage is so deeply ingrained in this machine that when they took it to Le Mans in 1995 and faced off against purpose-built racing machines, they won. So, with something like the F1 to live up to, where do you go next? Well, you throw the book away again and write an even better one. The result is the McLaren P1, a hybrid electric sports car that stands head and shoulders above the F1. The P1 GTR will hit 60 miles an hour in 2.4 seconds. That's 0.7 seconds faster than the F1. That's an eternity for a supercar. The car's blistering performance is delivered by a twin-turbo V8, supplemented by a McLaren ECU electric motor and instant power assist system. And they do mean instant. Remember those problems with turbo lag? McLaren solved that with the hybrid drive. While the turbos build pressure, the electric motor drives the wheels. No turbo lag, just torque. And because it's a hybrid, it has an all-electric range. Running on batteries alone, that's 6.2 miles. A bit more if you're going downhill. I quite like sleeper cars. Did Alex ever tell you the story of what we got up to in Colorado? There was this sleeper car competition, you see. Let's just say no one was ready for the sunbeam. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. The tyres were widened and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. A 177 miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four-door saloon. Only 950 of these custom gems were built, and they've become something of a modern classic. The Lotus Carlton was an example of how to turn a saloon into a supercar, but that's not the only thing Lotus got up to. In 1979, Chrysler approached Lotus to create a strict rally version of their Sunbeam three-door hatchback. Lotus, as you might imagine, rather enjoyed the challenge. They took the rear-wheel drive hatchback and changed everything that matters. They stiffened the suspension, improved the anti-roll bars and widened the transmission tunnel.
Lotus Sunbeam was revealed to the public in 1979 in Geneva to widespread praise in the motoring media. makes me wonder if Lotus should do more conversion. It's a silly question, actually. Lotus should do more conversions. In fact, I'll call them right now. I honestly think these might be some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And the story of how it came about is, well, really British. Get in the car and let's get this segment. Jaguar is a bit of a favourite of mine. The company is almost 100 years old and was originally founded to build sidecars for motorcycles. But this is the car that really set the bar, I think. The 1961 E-Type. When he saw it, Enzo Ferrari called it the most beautiful car in the world. High praise indeed. He wasn't alone in his admiration. Accolades have followed this car ever since. It's been in movies, comics, games and TV shows. solid too, with a design based on the D-Type that won the 24 Hours of Le Mans three years in a row. Anyone who owns an E-Type will tell you that the key to their reliability is to drive them regularly, as if you'd need the excuse. About two and a half thousand were built, and they're a common sight at auto shows, and surprisingly reasonably priced. All in all, an almost perfect Jaguar. The E-Type was the successor to the Le Mans winning D-Type, but what would that look like if Jaguar designed it today? In 2013, Jaguar answered that question with the F-Type Project 7, a spiritual successor to the E-Type, and designed from the ground up to be the purest, most enjoyable Jaguar yet. The car's heritage is proudly displayed in the gorgeous D-Type curves and the distinctive aero hunch behind the driving position. But like the E-Type, it's not just a pretty face. by a 5-litre V8 supercharged engine. With a fully aluminium body, it's blisteringly fast. With a 0-60 speed of 3.8 seconds and a top speed of 186 miles an hour. A car as beautiful as this must surely have been a carefully authored design. Actually, it started as a sketch by designer Cesar Pieri thrown together one Friday in his free time. Jaguar's design director, Ian Callum, saw the sketch in a thumbnail on Cesar's computer during a meeting and asked him what it was. The rest is history. Two hundred and fifty Project 7s were built as both a successor to the E-Type and as a celebration of Jaguar's victories at Le Mans. I think I 
speak for all of us when I say, thank heavens for Cesar's Friday afternoon doodle. We're almost done, but we saved the good stuff for last. A spot of rallying in the most British car of them all. Get in, strap in, and let's nail this one. There is one car built in Great Britain that is, quite fairly, considered one of the most influential cars of the century. It's a surprisingly spacious little city car with a side-mounted engine. It's an icon of popular culture. It's been built on every continent where there's a car factory. It's the Mini. The Mini Cooper S was built to be a performance machine with deeper engines, twin carburettors and front disc brakes. This scrappy little machine would go on to achieve more than 30 racing victories in the 1960s and 1970s. A Mini Cooper S flying number 37 placed first at the 1964 Monte Carlo Rally. Driven by Paddy Hopkirk and Henry Lydon, this was the last time an all-British crew would win the event. But not the last time a Mini would. At Monte Carlo in 1966, Minis took the first, second and third positions. They were all disqualified because they had dimming headlamps. Not because they were winning everything in sight. In 1999, the Car of the Century Award was presented to the most influential car of the 20th century. The Mini came second. It was beaten by the Model T Ford. That's fair, I suppose. 5.3 million Minis would be sold, making it the most popular British car. And then, in 2000, BMW resumed production of the Mini, breathing new life into the iconic mark. If the Mini of the 1960s had its sights set on the roads of Monte Carlo, the X-rayed Countryman has its eyes on something a little tougher. The deserts and rough terrain of the Dakar, for starters, a wit once said that the only thing mini in this monster was the pedal. That's rather missing the point, I think. The X-rayed Countryman is much, much bigger than the Mini Cooper. It has to be. A stage of the Dakar demands literally tons of gear. You could call it a tank. It does rather sound like one. When Mini's X-Raid division set out to build this thing, they had one goal in mind, winning the Dakar. And they did, every year, from 2012 to 2015. It's designed to be driven for two weeks over deserts and badlands, five kilometers above sea level. And it still handles like a hot hatch on a nice bit of dry air. Owners come and go. The heritage of a car like the Mini is more than who owns the keys to the shop. I fully expect to see Mini's wings flying for another century. This is quite the story. Bentley at Le Mans in the 1930s. Gentlemen racers, heroic driving, and a personal hero of mine. Take good care of the cars, though. Both of them are mine. Bentley, a company founded in 1919 in Cricklewood, North London, and purchased by Rolls-Royce in the 30s. 
a company synonymous with both racing and luxury. Perhaps the best example I know of those two extremes of British engineering. For almost a century, every Bentley was hand-built to exacting standards. So at the beginning of the 21st century, when Bentley revealed their first mass-produced car, there were a great many questions. The car was the Continental GT, an elegant grand tourer that combined a racetrack pedigree with exquisite style and all the power you could need. The move to mass production has done nothing to blunt the Bentley experience. The 2017 Continental Supersport is responsive, fast and beautifully designed. brings together all-wheel drive, carbon fibre bonnet sides and side skirts to create the most powerful performance-focused car the company has ever built. But never forget, Bentley's pedigree is racing, and the Bentley Continental embraces that. In 2007, a largely standard Continental Speed GT broke Bugatti's record for the flying kilometre on the frozen Baltic Sea. And then in 2011, they broke their own record. 205 miles an hour, both ways, on ice. Even when building these gorgeous Grand Tourers, Bentley is driven to excellence. Today, Bentley means modern, peerless luxury and elegance. But that's far from the full story. A century ago, Bentley meant something else entirely. It meant Le Mans. In 1930, eccentric race team owner Dorothy Paget financed a rather special Bentley at the Le Mans. It was a 4.5-litre supercharged masterpiece, driven by Sir Henry Bentley Boy Birkin. It posted the fastest time on the day, but it failed to finish. But what a race it was. Sir Henry's courageous driving forced Rudolf Caracciola's seven-litre Mercedes out of the race at the cost of his own victory. But in doing so, he handed the day to the Bentley Sixes, a gentleman racer indeed. Sir Henry knew he didn't have anything to prove. In 1929, the adventurer Mrs. Mary Victor Bruce had already driven the resolutely modern 4.5-litre Bentley at Montlahy, setting distance, speed and endurance records. The Bentley's performance so annoyed Ettore Bugatti that he called it the world's fastest lorry. Blower had the last laugh, though. In 2012, it was sold at auction for over £4 million, which is more than enough to buy a Veyron and a racing truck, if you're keeping the score. <laughs>